Hello, and welcome to It's Your Limp, a podcast about all things immunity, health, beauty, and longevity. I'm your host, Lisa Levitt Gainsley, and I've dedicated my entire career to working with people's lymphatic systems because the results are nothing short of astonishing. Come along as we reconnect to the flow of life and learn how to harness the power of lymph. Welcome to It's Your Lymph Podcast. My guest today is Carolyn Barron. She is known on Instagram as Botanarchy. She's an alchemistress who administers Chinese medicine and herbs. Thank you for coming on. I know you because I came to you after I had a car accident that really just... I've been in so many car accidents, but this one I got slammed from behind and it really just shook me to the core. And you helped me recover. And I have since brought my teenage son to you. And you've been, really helped him with so many things that he works on. So I thank you. And I know you and your medicine. But I'm excited to introduce you and your work to this audience for so many reasons. Before we begin, I like to do these icebreaker questions. First question is, your favorite place you've ever traveled? Oh, God, I'm going to give you the worst answer to this question, <laughs> which is that... <laughs> As an earth element, I'm more of the stay and put kind. And my most favorite place on the planet is my sycamore tree outside of my home. I mean, that is powerful. Yeah. I travel there daily. And I think to me, like building longer term relationships that really nourish and sustain fulfills me more than like the ephemeral nature of moving around the globe. <laughs> you know, thank you so much for that answer. I love that answer. And I'm a big traveler and it's so important for my spirit and my soul to travel and my creativity. Yeah. But what happens when I travel is I always look to the lessons as how can I bring this energy back to my home into my daily life? Yes, like a little seed to plant and germinate and bring something new to the ecosystem of your garden. So I love that yours is your sycamore tree. Okay, next question. If your lymph could talk, what would it say, my dear? Oh, it would say right now in this unit of time, please have somebody help like scoop this pond scum off the surface of me. <laughs> <laughs> is that because we've had such a wet winter here in Los Angeles? Why do you think that is? Well, this is sort of ties back into the travel question, but back in November, I went on my honeymoon. Yay. And in traveling to Italy, we were finally, after three years being COVID free, we were besieged by the COVID. You did get the, we got it when we got back from Italy too. Ah, classic. Well, all the Italians kept joking and they were like, oh, all the Americans, they get the COVID in Italy. Ah, ah, ah. And, <laughs> and I mean, we truly, it was a minor experience, but I've worked with you as well. And as you may remember from working with me is that I have an Epstein bar history, which I have kept at bay. So COVID was like just a blip on the radar, but because we were in the throes of our honeymoon and like drinking wine and romper stomping around vineyards every day and eating rich foods and then being in incredibly stressful travel situations and long plane rides, I ended up getting Epstein bar on the way home. And so I've been sort of fighting recurrent infections right now that just kind of bubble up in my nodes and I've had some recurrent tonsillitis and, you know, little swollen nodes that I keep like sending little impulses to and they go down and then I don't get enough sleep and then they get scummy again. <laughs> you know how the dance goes. You know, thank you so much for sharing that for our listeners, there's so much to unpack in this conversation uh, just about that because, you know, one of the things when I was reading about the way the COVID virus enters the body is similar to how so like the Epstein-Barr bar virus works or like the HIV or the herpes virus, just how it can root and penetrate and trip up other viruses that are dormant or have been dormant, which is what I haven't liked about what I see about the COVID virus. And I think there's so many people who are like, want to politicize it or underplay it, or there's just so much hyperbole around it. But I love to just get into the science of 
what a virus does in the body and what it affects and why some people just don't want it because it can tip the balance of something that you've had in check. It will exploit weaknesses in your inner ecosystem and root in vastly different ways, which is why it's been very persnickety and hard to pin down because depending on what your inner climate is, it's going to amplify whatever weather system has been blowing through the body. And lymphatic massage is so beneficial for Epstein-Barr, for fibromyalgia. There's, you know, evidence in how beneficial it is for, you know, inflammation and other things in the body. So I appreciate that you're saying if your lymph could talk, that it would say, please utilize the lymphatic medicine to help deal with these other viral things that are popping up. So, okay. Last icebreaker question. Again, not like we need an icebreaker question, but last one. What is your current favorite self-care practice? Ah, oh, I'm doing it right now. I'm currently enthralled in a love affair with the higher dose mat. Yeah. Yeah. It's been so crucial and transformational for me right now because everything is a bit sluggish and stagnant and heat has been such a profound ally to me. And I also find that, you know, when I get cold, everything in my body contracts and I'm you know, less inspired, less alight. And so on my days when I'm home writing or if talking to you in this conversation, I feel like it just keeps all of my like, you know, vital substances circulating through the body. Yes. Infrared. And I'm such a big proponent of that too. I got on mine the other day. Okay. So question for you. So how I want to begin introducing you to people and to the way you do five element Chinese medicine and acupuncture is when I started seeing you, as I said, for my car accident, one of the reasons I wanted to come see you, and I've seen a bunch of different acupuncturists at different times in my life for different things. But the reason I wanted to come to you is my first acupuncturist was when I was living in San Francisco in the late 80s, early 90s, was at Chinese Medicine Works in Noe Valley, San Francisco. And the practitioners were Ephraim Korngold and Harriet Beanfeld. They wrote between heaven and earth, which was for me in my 20s, such a beautiful introduction to Chinese medicine for the Western audience, because they're Westerners, and such a deep dive and an honoring of this ancient tradition. And when I came to see you, I discovered that you are a student of a similar path. So can you please talk to us about your background, your origin story, and the five element theory and what you do? Absolutely. And they are like literal icons. And that's so fabulous that that was your just casual toe dip in the waters of Chinese medicine. Right? <laughs> yeah. So I like to sort of say the work that I do is I practice holistic primary care medicine guided by the poetry of nature. And so I use the framework of the five elements of wood, fire, earth, metal, and water to bring the mysteries of the body alive for my patients. And there is a style of medicine that is traditional five element acupuncture, and my practice is informed by that. I use an ecological lens to decode the mysteries of the body. So what that looks like is when I'm sort of rooting out this sort of cause of suffering and pain and disease where we're using the language of the natural world to flesh out the suffering for my patients, which helps them participate in it fully and understand their body in a different way. I always tell my patients that these places of disease and discomfort, they're like weather systems that are blowing through the body. And, you know, we have to merge with them and we have to understand how to shift our internal climate and ecosystem so that they can pass through and that we're relatively unscathed. And that all we're left with was the wisdom of what to do differently next time and how to re build resilience in the future so that we don't end up in the same position. So we use herbs, we use acupuncture. I'll make like gentle nutritional customized protocols and it's working on every level. So I'm never gonna just work on the physical repercussions of a car accident with the patient because we have to get into the trauma. How did you get into this work? What led you here? I think I came into it initially through philosophy. I had studied a lot of Taoist philosophy in college and in high school. And when I discovered there was a medicine years later, 
that adapted those principles into an ecological model of the body, I was aghast and alight and ended up needing to draw heavily on its resources when I was in my early 20s and at the advent of getting diagnosed with an autoimmune disease, which for anybody who suffered with them knows that they're often very nebulous and difficult to diagnose. And you end up sort of suffering in a bardo for a very long time with lots of persnickety symptoms and a lot of what Western medicine has to offer does not extend itself into the realm of autoimmunity. And so most of us are often forced to access other medicines. Yeah. So I want to talk about a little bit about autoimmunity because there's different kinds of autoimmune disorders or conditions, however you want to say them. And Everybody reacts differently to them. And I think in the, in the world of talking about your immune system, we try to be careful with the language of the immune system is you're not always trying to stoke the immune system because some people's immune systems are in overdrive. And so how do we more harmonize or balance the immune system or create that ecosystem, that environment where your immune system can do what it needs to do? Absolutely. And I think this is why this medicine is so elegant and nuanced in treating these patterns, because oftentimes it's a little bit more complex than that, because typically when I encounter a patient with autoimmune issues, like there is a combination of both excess and deficiency happening at once. And so the excess is the expression, the acute expressions of the inflammation and the acute symptomology and pain, but the deficiency is what's underneath. And that is different ways that we have been burning through our resources and not sequestering and storing and building up enough like internal resilience and chi to stop the cycle from repeating itself over and over again. And so we have to do both. Why do you think there's so much autoimmunity going on? That is the question everybody wants to answer. And I think that there's so many layers to that. I think in a really broad sense, not to get so philosophical, but I think that in the broadest sense is because that we're living very much out of alignment with the needs of our body and the sort of cadence, the more gentle cadence of nature. Right. And so these expressions that are turning themselves on the body, which is causing the body to attack itself. Right. So much we would say that that is there's things that we are doing and they're accumulating over time that are very much out of alignment with our inner nature. And they're they're creating this environment where there's like a chronic degenerative condition happening. That's from the ways that we push our will that's from the ways that we overuse our bodies and overtax our bodies that we have to in order to sort of stay alive and thrive in a way that we were never meant to do. And, you know, it's from a smaller level too, like from what we kind of ingest to how we move everything. These cycles are all a little bit skewed. You know, it's so funny that you talk about our will in a, another podcast. I was talking about how as a Leo, you know, I'm like, I will, I will make this happen. And I will do this. And for a long time in my life, I really like used my will to make shit happen. And it was beneficial. But I was also sort of like in the emergency room a lot with like accidents and like, you know, stitches here and there. And until I really in my early 20s said, Okay, I get it. I'm going to slow down, be more in the flow of nature no more emergency room visits. And can I listen to my body what it needs earlier before these things, these accidents happen? Yeah. I mean, that is a profound lesson and a really beautiful way to engage with your symptomology and turn it into wisdom. Can you explain to people, for people who are new to acupuncture, new to Chinese medicine, which is, I know, just a subset of what you practice, but for people who are listening, we are talking about the five element theory. And I have to tell you that the reason why I do lymph work actually derived from studying the five element theory in college. When I was, <gasps> when I wrote a paper, um, I studied anthropology. So when we, that's where we also have in common about philosophy is I was, you know, at the time in the late eighties, acupuncture was sort of seen as woo woo. 
But I was looking at the way different cultures heal, and I was doing a paper and a presentation on the five element theory, and I really fell in love with it. And that's what made me want to go into the healing arts. And I chose massage school over acupuncture school, but it was like my foray into complementary and otherworldly systems of healing. And I just love the five element theory. So will you break it down for us, please? Yeah. So to start talking about the five elements, we almost have to go like a little bit further back. We have to think of our bodies in the context of nature. So, you know, this tradition is very ancient and it predates dissection and microscopy and the way that we've come to understand our body as this kind of fixed static thing, right? So in this medicine, we really think of our body as not a fixed thing. It's a flowing current of water that's contained within the flesh of earth. And our bodies are thought of as an ecosystem with the five elements of wood, fire, earth, metal, and water mingling and commingling to form weather patterns that show up as expressions of disease and discomfort in the body. And each person has a unique inner ecosystem that's somewhat like a blueprint that's going to form the basis of both disease and health in their lifetime. And so it's kind of a blueprint of the superpowers and setbacks that you and your very unique ecosystem may encounter throughout the course of your life, right? And it sort of contextualizes how one person's stress patterns show up as like IBS and stomach aches, whereas another person's stress patterns show up as like rashes and rosacea, right? Because we can all encounter the same virus like COVID, but how it's going to express itself is going to have an infinite myriad of expressions. And so five element medicine really is about witnessing these patterns of nature as they unfold in the body and sort of decoding symptoms through an ecological lens. So whereas like somebody may say, I have a pounding, throbbing headache behind my right eye, we really think of this as just like wood energy that's shooting upwards and outwards. And it's jutting up, right? And it's like pressing up against like the top of the body. And so I find that it creates like a really beautiful language to decode and bring alive the mysteries of the body which empowers people to take a more active and engaged role in their health because these are central metaphors that are central to being alive and in a body and every person pan-culturally can understand them and really feel their gentle imprint. I love that. And I think that that's what drew me to it too, is looking at the questionnaires in the book between heaven and earth, or, you know, people can look online and there are certain questionnaires that you can look at to see where you're maybe in balance or where you're predisposed to. Like I have a, I think a lot of fire in me. (laughs) Very much so. (laughs) I concur emphatically. And like, I hate the, I hate the wind, you know, and understanding the wheel of the elements and what element nurtures. If my primary element is fire, wood stokes that fire, right? And then does water hamper? What was the one that hampers it? Well, so with so we can take fire as an example. It's created by wood. And so wood nourishes fire and then its ashes will come and create earth, right? And then water will control the flame. Control the flame. Because I actually love being in water. Ah, absolutely. It's like so healing and so grandy, but maybe that medicine is what balances my fire and controls it and keeps me... Never thought of it that way. Oh, absolutely. Because it probably, to you, it subdues some of the more sort of like yang aspects of your personality that are constantly pushing and extending and doing. And it like brings this like containment of just like being, being in flow, being in stillness, regenerating in a different way, (laughs) regenerating without burning through the will, regenerating in like stillness and receptivity. Yes. So will you walk us through the different elements so people can recognize certain characteristics of the elements or what might come up for people with the different elements? 
Absolutely. Um, this is a fun exercise too, because they're really alive and so potent in the body. And it's really fun to wake up to their presences because then you can start to see how they're moving through you in a daily basis. And I will preface this by also saying that even though we may have like a dominant element that's expressing itself through us, we are all of the elements and their interplay is going to form both the basis of disease and health in our bodies. We'll start with wood because today is the onset of spring and it's the spring equinox at the Northern Hemisphere. So wood energy in our body is really represented by our tendons and ligaments and these firmaments that hold us upright, like the sort of branches and roots of a tree, right? It's our sort of like all the connective tissue that wraps around our skeletal system that allows forward movement. It's things that bring structure for the flow of water through the body. The energy of the wood element, it's that like vital spark of life. And so it's that emergent energy of spring and it wants to go up and out and extend in all directions like the branches of a tree. Mm, I love that. And then some of the challenges of wood, what would you see those manifesting in the body? A lot of challenges to wood have to do with impediments to flow and growth and purpose. And so that could be fixed stabbing pain issues, right? Um, that could be anything that like sort of surges upwards, like a strong migraine or a headache or vertigo or ringing in the ears. A lot of like depression and feeling stagnant and lacking creativity and not being in our flow. These are sort of some of the psycho-emotional aspects of a wood element out of balance. Because of the impulse of wood is to go forward and envision and grow, the wood element really thrives with creative outlets that extend these things into the world. I have a dear friend who's having really bad ear stuff and hearing stuff and has been going to like ENTs and you know all these things and I'm like ooh, I think he needs to tap into some creative juice actually <laughs> I mean these are the things that we can do all of the things correctly right but if things keep coming back over and over again usually underneath the very like physical manifestations of like neck compression or ear crystals or whatever things are causing the ringing, there's usually something where there is like that thwarted movement in the exterior world. That's wood. What about, what would you say next? Would you say metal next? Or what, what would you talk to us next about? Well, in the creation cycle, so wood creates fire. Fire, my favorite. I mean, they're all my favorite. They're all my favorite. Let's be clear. <laughs> exactly. It's hard to pick your favorite season. <laughs> <laughs> Although but summer you, is my favorite. It's truly, and you're a very dominant fire person. And it's very attractive in general because it's represented in like if the wood energy is the sprout, the, the fire energy is the flower. And so fire is sort of all of the archetypal energies of summer are ensconced within the fire element. And so summer quickens things, it has heat, it has vibrancy, it has warmth. It's very easy to root into fire energy in the body because it's very loud. <laughs> fire energy is hot, it moves fast, it's red, it speaks to inflammation, it speaks to rashes, it speaks to sweating, or even things that quicken the spirit like overactive sensations and perceptions, insomnia, Insomnia, mania, all of these things can be thought of as fire energy out of balance. Okay, so I, it's funny, I, I had a little bit of insomnia the last two weeks. I'm much better now, but I did have that. That's, so that's some fire imbalance. It's precisely, and somebody with like a dominant fire constitution, when they are put under stress or pressure, um, manifestation of that will be more anxiety and insomnia versus a wood element person that would feel more like frustration and anger and rage. That's like exactly in my mind. I've just been like plagued with this recurring, you know, weird, anxious conversation that I'm so not used to. It's interesting. Yeah, girl, you got to just jump in the ocean. I know. <laughs> Do a little it's alchemy. Like raining and freezing. <laughs> so I'm like baths, baths, baths. I need more baths. 
Yeah, really looking at how everyone's sort of stress type manifests, I think really brings the elements alive because we really do understand our bodies under like under pressure. What happens in our ecosystem when the pressure is increased? So after fire is... So the ashes of fire create earth and earth energy is sort of, it's our digestive system obviously which is how we connect to the abundance of earth and how we transform like earth's gifts into utilizable energy right and so the earth element like it is in the center of our bodies here and our lovely little furnace and so earth element energy out of balance can be impediments to our digestion and assimilation And typically, somebody with an earth imbalance may start to accumulate a lot of dampness. Just think of when the earth has too much water and it turns to mud. So earth people, when they are out of balance, they kind of tend to accumulate and expand. (laughs) And that can look like bloating or lymphedema. And it can look sort of like chronic phlegm. It can look like tiredness and heaviness and lethargy. An earth element person with a dominant earth constitution that's under a lot of pressure and stress, it will show up for them as like worry. And so we think of worry in the same way we think of digestive imbalances, right? It's an emotional indigestion. You are chewing over the same piece of information over and over again and never digesting it and turning it into wisdom. Oh, this is so juicy. I love this so much. And I feel like I've been talking to so many people lately who have like, IBS or Crohn's or colitis or digestive, like it's like such a bucket of digestive stuff. Is all of that wood or not necessarily because there's so many different subsets? Oh, yes. There's so many different patterns. Like for, you know, in IBS in Western medicine, there's IBS C and there's IBS D. You either get constipated or you get diarrhea. In Chinese medicine, there is like an infinite number of expressions of this because you can have alternating constipation and diarrhea. And this is a pattern we say of that expression of the wood element and it's kind of overacting on the digestive system. So that aggressive energy of the wood element is impeding the digestive system in a very particular way, right? So there's so many nuances to it. It's not always an earth imbalance, but more often than not it is but it can be earth is mixed with different elements and so like leaky gut you know i think about when you're talking about like heavy rains in the earth and especially we've been getting so much rain in california and our drainage system not being sort of set up to handle that and that does sort of feel like the drainage system in the gut yeah so when like You know, obviously leaky gut is sort of a very modern term. And if we were going to kind of investigate this through the lens of East Asian medicine, we would like look at what that symptomology expresses itself in the body, right? And so with like leaky gut, we tend to get that expression of like dampness and stagnation and pressure, right? And so we have like fluid where it's not supposed to be. (laughs) Like lymph. Also, that sounds like lymph, like, right? It does. Just like lymph that can't get moved. Precisely. I mean, in the most simplest terms, you know, our bodies are these like rivers and tributaries that are shuttling, you know, fluid life force energy throughout the body. And all disease, all disease is a manifestation of stagnation or obstruction of flow. Repeat that one more time. It's such potent medicine. In the lens of this medicine, all of disease and discomfort is all a manifestation of impediments and obstructions to flow of the vital fluids in the body. And that could be blood, that could be marrow, that could be lymph. Right. And that if we think about the sort of pond scum metaphor of earlier, right, when you are like a flowing vital river and something happens like there's a a mudslide or a rock slide and suddenly over time the flow has been impeded, what happens, right, is that a little layer of scum and algae starts to rise to the top 
And in that space of lack of flow, that flowing vital river has turned into like a stinky festering bog, right? Or drought. Precisely. Precisely. Because if you have that like contained pond, right? It's, it's blocking the flow of these like waterways to other parts of the body. This is so amazing. Okay. So that's earth. What's next? And so the containment of earth creates metals and metal energy in the body, right? These are our barriers and protective shields. This is the sort of lung and the respiratory system that is the kind of way that we interact with our environment. The metal element in the body is often difficult to understand because people think of metal as these kind of like hard fixed thing, but metal can be like quicksilver and mercury. Metal can be many different forms. People with a lot of metal in their bodies, their stress can manifest as issues with, you know, their barrier systems, which means that these are people that are likely to get chronically sick when under stress. These are people who get lots of colds and flus or are hypersensitive to their environment. And so maybe this is like a very, like an allergic type of a stress response or a person whose stress manifests a lot as rashes or things on the surface of the body. Like eczema? Yeah, like eczema. Absolutely. Metal energy is protective energy, right? And so anytime that somebody feels like overly sensitive or is, you know, has environmental sensitivities, these protective shields. Oh, or what about like environmental pollutants or, or toxins or mold? Is that metal? So if there's a, a pathogenic factor in the environment like that, it's going to affect everybody. <laughs> I guess what I'm sort of getting at is like, there are people who have certain constitutions and then you have people who come in who are presenting with an imbalance in a different constitution. Precisely. So you have to both kind of do the work of rooting out the constitution and seeing what weather system is unfolding in the body at the same time. Yeah. So fire, earth, metal, water. Do we do air? This is the, the grand ruse is that in the Western elemental traditions, their fifth element is air, but ours is metal. So there is no air in the five element system, although wind is obviously a climactic factor that affects the body. But metal sort of represents in a lot of ways some of the attributes of what people would consider air. Mm, that ether. So question for you. I studied Chinate Song, which is, you know, a visceral manipulation, and we did a lot of Qigong. And what my teacher taught us about the organs in the body, each of them have an emotion. Can you speak to some of the emotions in the organs and how you look at that medicine if somebody comes in talking about their emotions and relating to the different organs? They just like, regardless of a patient is talking about them or not, like their presence in the room is undeniable. <laughs> So a lot of times people will talk about one emotion, but you really see the emotion that's under the surface. Okay, we forgot water and I can never shun one of my elemental kin. The sort of mineral matrices of metal dissolve to become water. And so that's our fifth element. And water is also a little bit more easy to explain in the body because it's so literally palpable. Water sort of corresponds to the, like, the fluid matrices of the body and it's presided over by the kidneys and the urinary bladder. And it's our sort of reservoirs of life force and raw power and how they're utilized through the body. And water energy really manifests in many phases as does water does itself, right? And you can see it in the quality of the skin and the moisture quality of the body. It's obviously one manifestation of water. Cold is the sort of the climate of water out of balance. So people with like water issues, which my immune issue hypothyroidism would kind of fall under a water pathology because it comes with a lot of like fluid retention and edema and cold lack of circulation, lack of like vital essence in the body. Water people out of balance tend to go into like those fear and freeze states. 
Whereas like fire people will get like manic and like overly excited and just blaze like water contracts and it gets still and quiet and it sort of gets locked up and frozen. So fight or flight over time initially, it often looks like a fire element thing, but over time it goes into those freeze states where we get shut down. And so then to speak of the emotions then, the emotion that's associated with a water element out of balance is fear. We think about the energy of fear. When we get fearful, chi sinks, much like water. <laughs> so we feel that sinking sensation. All that sort of energy kind of descends downward. Sometimes we even like urinate a little bit when we get really scared. So that's the sort of emotion associated with water. With wood out of balance, it manifests as anger right? That's that explosive outward push. And with fire, it's joy, but also lack of joy and apathy. So when we have these like untempered relationships with joy and it's either blazing out of control or it's, we're cut off from it, that's a fire element. And then moving from fire to earth, like we spoke about before, earth is worry. And so you could see that in a patient that would come to see me who is just sort of obsessed with their health and completely worried that something is always going wrong and like thinks that like their body is turning on them constantly, always worried about every little thing that like bristles up. And after earth comes metal and with like metal energy is sadness and grief. And that again, so after the sort of like freeze of contraction, the first kind of inward pull that we have is grief and sadness, which kind of collapses and our can't take a deep breath, our lungs can't take in, we get kind of contracted in general. There's that sort of like tightening over the chest. Yeah. And there are external things that can create those emotions, right? Like the death of a loved one or even COVID hitting the lungs or a heartbreak hitting that space. So there's different things that then if they came to see you, you could tell, is this a constitution long-term or is this a external event that they're in at the moment? Yes. And it's often a combination of both things, but we do look for that moment that would be like the death of a loved one, right? That would be like a climate, that would be like a climate striking the body. So we always have to look and root out these moments, like when did the symptom first begin? You know, and sometimes it's like, oh, I ate too much ice cream and then I started coughing. And ever since then, I feel like I've had asthma whenever I eat something that's cold. You know, so we kind of trace back like a little Nancy Drew, little elemental Nancy Drew, and we go back in this sort of history of a patient and we look for the time that that first showed up in the body. And so, you know, I do that with clients too, and with a it, with an intake when they're they're coming in saying, you know, whatever is going on that's related to, they think it's related to their lymph, or not, they're not sure, but they've looked at a lot of places and so they're coming to me for lymph. And I'll go back into certain history and we'll look and see, okay, potentially this manifestation that I see in the body as lymph now may have started way back when you got mono as a kid, or if you got bit by a tick and it's Lyme, or you, you know, Epstein-Barr virus, or, you know, a surgery, or, you know, like traveling back in time with lymph, it's like, it rarely comes on so fast. Yeah with what you're talking about with this water accumulation, right? It's usually comes on slowly. All of a sudden you might see it, but it's been building or there's been different roadblocks that haven't been unblocked yes. that lead to a lymph appearance. Yes. And lymph is very complicated to suss out, right? Because it's so nuanced. It is, you know, the river and the tributary system that links together all the other systems of the body. So the endocrine system, the immune system, the cardiovascular system, the musculoskeletal system. The lymphatic system, the digestive system. How does Chinese medicine or the medicine that you have studied view lymph? Well, because this medicine is so ancient and, you know, predates knowing of a system called the lymphatic system, I mean, it 
was implicitly understood in the language of this medicine what a lymph node was and that it was intimately embroiled with like pathogens and the immune system and the spleen. So all of these relationships are encoded in the medicine, but we do not have a meridian system for the lymphatic system per se. Mm. But what we do have is an energetic meridian called the Sanjiao which most closely resembles the lymphatic system, both in its pathways through the body and also how it functions in the body. So the San Zhao, that translates to triple warmer, which means that the function of the San Zhao is to move like qi through the three areas of the body, the upper, the middle, the lower, the upper warmer being our lungs and our heart, the middle warmer being our digestive system and our spleen and our liver, and the lower warmer being our kidneys and reproductive system. So it is the role of the San Zhao to promote the circulation of vital substances between one and the other. And it is really thought of as a river and a tributary and a fluid matrix. When would you utilize that meridian? Well, so one, when there's obvious like lymphedema or congestion and a lot of the sort of pathologies that one would put under the umbrella of a lymph issue. And so that could be like swollen glands, chronic ear infections, tonsillitis, but that can also be things like temperature irregularities in the body, right? Because I think of the San Zhao as like a, a cauldron, right? It's a little cauldron that is there to protect, warm, and circulate energy through the body. And so whenever there's issues with like metabolic processes, we can look to the San Zhao when there are issues with very intimately embroiled with every other meridian system because like we spoke to before, lymph like permeates and penetrates the whole. So having come to see you, there are different times you will use needles. There are times where you use moxibustion or cupping. I love the cups. And if you could just speak to when somebody comes in, how do you find that roadmap to help them connect back to their bodies? wisdom of healing and how do you know what to use when? Well, I typically always, if only once, <laughs> will use acupuncture because I think that it disrupts these patterns in our bodies so profoundly that keep us fixed in one way of being. And I think even if a patient is very needle resistant, I will encourage even maybe one or two very gentle needles because I think it's important to have an alternate experience of the body. You know, speaking to before to, you know, the sort of Western concept of the body being this fixed immovable mass. And I really want to wake people up to the fluid spiraling power of life contained within them. And I think when you are laying on that table retaining needles, you start to feel the circulation of chi in the body. And I think that's a very empowering initiation into somebody's like power that needs to be had for healing to occur. I was not needle averse when I first started acupuncture like 30 years ago or something. But what I want the listeners who have not experienced acupuncture maybe to realize is it is some of the most profoundly deep rest, if not sleep, that I have ever had. And if you are somebody who is needle averse, you're just like, how do you sleep with needles all over your body? And it's like, yeah. I would go in sometimes to, even if I was just feeling like emotionally low or, you know, just like blah, I would just go in for the needles and for that deep rest. The only other place where I experience that in a practitioner is with lymph, lymph work. Yes. Which to me is like very, it's the same, like we are working with the same core ethos, which is being, bringing movement and flow. Even my son, who was sort of like, oh, I can't believe I'm going to have needles in my body. And I, he came to you when I think he was 14 and he loved it. And he was needle averse, like 
as a baby. Yeah, well, I mean, it is a truly magical medicine. It is really like oftentimes people will think that they'll just like, oh, the needle is like putting energy into my body or it's putting something in and it's like, actually, no, it's just bringing things up from the depths and circulating them. Yeah, because we're so used to in Western culture, you get a needle to inject something in not pull something out. It's a different way of looking at it. It is. And this is just really just kind of like engaging with like the tissues in a really intelligent way. You know, I think we all feel quite tired. (laughs) But when (laughs) you actually have an acupuncture session, when you have a lymphatic session, and when you bring movement, you realize like, no, actually things are just like, there's vital resources. They're just buried very deep in there. But the acupuncture is a really beautiful and important, like reacquainting oneself with that. I love that, you know, and I love I love the way you talk about the needles as, you know, it's a great, it's a powerful disruptor, not in a bad way. Like I always think of acupuncture as it helps bring about your chi and helps unblock things. But I never think of that root is being like disrupting like a a block or a stagnation or a, it's such a beautiful way to frame that word disruptor. Well, yeah, I mean, change is life. And you either go with the flow or the flow consumes you. And like when we are suffering, we really like kind of long for comfort and we resist change. But sometimes change is the motive force that actually brings on the healing, you know? So those vectors of change are really important for the healing process to get activated. I think that's why I love travel so much. Like I, I think I had disruption from my mother dying at such a pivotal age. And so like I had to get really comfortable with the unknown and things that I can't control. And so I love being plopped in a foreign city with like no idea where I'm going and like surrendering to the possibilities. Yes. My mentor, Lori Deshar, you should read her book, everybody. She always says that, um, she, well, the one that I think is like book exquisite for patients and I was giving away with Wild Abandon is The Alchemy of Inner Work. And it's written not for practitioners of East Asian medicine, but for people that would love to utilize the philosophy in their own life. And it's a really beautiful tome. But she always says that anything that moves chi is an acupuncture needle. So travel can be an acupuncture needle for you. There's a study, and I will link it in the show notes, that they just started doing acupuncture for breast cancer-related lymphedema. And it's so funny because for so long in the lymphatic community, and even I say this too, which is I'm always conservative and careful if somebody does have lymphedema in the arm. Like We always say, like, don't do blood pressure, cuffs, because that's true. It could bring on lymphedema, or if somebody does have lymphedema, be careful of a bee sting because then bacteria could enter quickly and create cellulitis, which can run systemically through the body. But acupuncture, so I've always sort of been careful when my clients go to get acupuncture. I'm like, oh, I don't know if you want to do it in that arm. But there is a medicine for that to happen. Well, I really feel like this medicine is very elegant and nuanced, whereas like other modalities may sort of look to a fixed mass or fluid accumulation in an area of the body and be like, okay, well, we have to, we have to break it up. The really beautiful elegance of this medicine is that we course it somewhere. And so this means that it's very low risk if it's practiced correctly, because it's not going to have a side effect from the treatment. A really perfect acupuncture treatment, you notice nothing except you feel more yourself and you've had perhaps a bit of an easement of a symptom. Because if you are a skilled practitioner is working on lymphedema in the breast area, then what they're doing is actually giving space or making space elsewhere for that fluid to flow out, right? And doing this in a very gentle way that's not breaking the skin or agitating or irritating the area. Yes, yes. You are opening up the roots of drainage and the ability for that stagnant fluid to move. So one of the things that I really love about when I was learning about the five element theory and Chinese medicine is that the way, and you speak to this without saying it outright, which is the perception of the body as a garden. 
Whereas in Western medicine, we look at it as the mechanic, right? So it's like, how in Western medicine, it's like, how do I fix X, Y, or Z? And in Western medicine, it's like, how do I tend to that inner garden? Precisely. There's a compartmentalization that happens in Western medicine, which is why we're all like sort of underserved and undernourished by the system because we'll go in with a complex problem and we go to our GP and they're like, I don't know, go to a neurologist. I mean, if you're lucky enough to even get a referral, right? And then the neurologist is kind of like, oh, actually, I don't know, maybe you should be seeing some pain specialist. And there's all this compartmentalization. Instead of sort of looking at the body in this holistic viewpoint where it's like, okay, how can we support the entirety of the ecosystem such that it can handle these things on its own. A garden, you just water and nourish and occasionally prune and it takes care of everything, right? But you have to give it the right environment to thrive. Yes, and everything's all connected. And so much in medicine is specializations in just one area without recognizing each area feeds, as we talked about, you know, feeds, either nourishes or controls or has effect on every other system. So you can't just treat one system. You have to look at the body as a whole, which is why I love this. I I just love this system. The other thing that I really love, and I wrote about in my book, The Book of Lymph, is my visceral, one of my visceral teachers taught us about the organs in the abdomen and how they all have different emotions and similarly weather patterns and how the goal and working in the abdomen is to create this beautiful, perfect day where the sun is shining like the fire, but it's not too hot. And there's a gentle breeze of the wind, but it's not too overwhelming, right? And like you have like your water and the mountains. And so you have this perfect day with all the elements in balance. So that's what like I'm always visualizing when I'm in someone's stomach. And what I want them to visualize when they're working with their own stomach is to create the perfect climate day. I am salivating and like gagging over this. (laughs) (laughs) This person sounds like an utter genius. And that's Such a beautiful central metaphor, right? Yeah. All right, my dear. Well, listen, this is the part of the podcast where we do a segment I like to call in flow and out of flow. So my dear, what does being in flow feel like to you? It it being in flow feels like I'm tapped into this mystical current of life and it's moving through me. And so it feels spontaneous and embodied and it feels like I can access like a great breath of emotions and power and creativity. I love that. So I want to ask you, I know this could be another hour, but I know enough that mysticism plays a role in your view of health. Can you speak to that? Well, in simplest terms, I'm an animist. And so I believe everything is alive, right? And when I am in flow, I am keenly aware of these movements as they're occurring both in my patients, but in the world at large. And I can feel the life force of a tree and I can engage with the sturdy, steadfast gravity of a mountain. And I feel really like tapped in to all of these messengers. To be out of flow, how do you overcome areas of stagnation? My garden requires a lot of tending. So there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes. (laughs) And I think this is true of a lot of people who hold space for people in trauma for eight, nine, 10 hours a day. Because I know my husband's the same and he's a psychotherapist and I imagine it's the same for you. But to be a steadfast space holder and be able to exist with that level of suffering all day, I have to take exquisitely good care of myself behind the scenes. And it's really annoying and it's like a full-time job. (laughs) And it's like, oh, it's like so stodgy. I really do have to protect my energy. I go to bed really early. And like when I am out with my friends, I tap out early. I'm infamous for standing on my table at parties and just like being like, it's over, everybody go home. (laughs) I need to regenerate my life force on a daily basis. I have to be really mindful about what I'm ingesting. And that means 
both like food and nutrients, but also like media and culture. I have to constantly empty. And because I am a writer and a poet, I don't want like the clutter of chaos and culture just sort of like impeding my own inner vision and my own inner voice. So I have to do a lot of distancing myself from those things. You know, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Because one of the things I think is really such a pillar and a building block for people that may not come naturally to them or boundaries. And I have a father who was like very good at boundaries and he really taught me boundaries. He was somebody who was like always kind of clear. And I was like a maybe girl, like maybe I'll do this now. and Maybe I'll do that now. Maybe I'm going to do that. But what I have learned through that boundary and I, and we try to give boundaries to our kids too, is to show that container, what is your container? What are those boundaries? So you can say no, you can say yes, you can figure out what you need is deep medicine and so important for people. You, especially as a practitioner, we can't, you can't give it all away. You can't give yourself all away. And that's not beneficial for anybody. No, absolutely nobody. You have to squirrel and sequester a little bit away for yourself. And it's really, really, I cannot stress enough how important for all of us to have a lot of like unstructured alone time Mm, to have non-directed movement where you're just like simmering in the stew, right? That's so important. Yes. When I do, when I offer a lymphatic cleanse a couple times a year, one of the things I tell people to do is like have this unplanned date somewhere. Yeah. Go for a walk or go to a different neighborhood or go to an art museum or go like take yourself on a date, you know, in that like artist's way, kind of do something that is not planned or by yourself. So you're just opening to that life force within you. It's so important. It's so exquisitely important. I mean, and that's really these spaces that we learn who we are. That is, I think, how the five element theory or Chinese medicine or that deep and deep ancient wisdom really helped me learn about myself and learning about what I need is learning about these five elements and how they work in the body emotionally or constitutionally. And you are such a great expressor of that medicine that you practice. So I just thank you for coming on and sharing that. And one last thing, if I can get you to sort of say to the listener, which is, where do people begin? Where, where would you recommend somebody begin if they're new to this or they're interested in this work or learning more? Where would you tell them to start? Well, even though at this point, it's probably 30 years old, Between Heaven and Earth is the sort of perennial tome of this medicine. I mean, this medicine is ancient and therefore any book that you pick up from Alan Watts's Tao, The Watercourse Way, written in the 60s, to that book written, I believe, in the 80s, to, you know, our fundamental treatise on Chinese medicine, which would be the Tao Te Ching, which is ageless, like it all ensconces the same philosophy. The Web That Has No Weaver. Yes, The Web That Has No Weaver by Ted Kapchuk is another really good one. I try to make my like website an immersive world and portal for exploring the elements and how they show up in our lives and sort of like longing to create a space where people could really come and interact with them. Like they're these like sacred archetypes and really wake up to them. But the answer is, is I think to sit in nature and to feel the wind and to resonate with how the presence of wind moves through your body and to start noticing and wakening up to these gentle imprints. I love that. I love that. So where can people find you and can people work with you? My brick and mortars, Botanarchy, Herbs and Acupuncture in Los Angeles. And my online world is Botanarchy.com. And I am writing a book. Yay! TB. (laughs) 
TBD. That is a quite a garden to sow and till. So we'll see what happens with that. But <laughs> and on Instagram, you're at Botanarchy. I'm at Botanarchy. Yeah. Yes. And I, if anybody is in LA, please, she has such a beautiful space. Go and see her. I'm sure you have fallen in love with her as I have. And the way she explains things are just so deep and moving and nourishing and nurturing. But also, you know, I can attest to I've had real growth and healing with you. And I just adore you from my heart. So thank you so much, Carolyn, for what you offer. Oh, it's so mutual. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I cannot tell you how many times I have bought your book for patience. Um, oh, thank you. I <laughs> yeah. love that. I love a spontaneous book gift for a patient. It's like, <laughs> oh, I love yeah. it. I love it. I love it. The mutual love club. Well, thank you again so much, everyone, for coming on. And I know you have a friend or a loved one who needs to hear this episode and this medicine. So please share with abandon and wild desire this episode. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you.